Welcome and greetings from Washington, D.C. I'm Tanya Joshua, Deputy Director of Policy and Communications Lead in the Office of Insular Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Thank you for joining us for OIA Conversations, where we share information and learn more about people, programs, and issues that are important and relevant to the U.S. territories and to the freely associated states. I am joined today by Philip Izadian, a Duke University student who provides assistance for this OIA conversation series. Today, we have the exciting opportunity to have a conversation with Ms. Nicole Yamase, a PhD candidate at the University of Hawaii, who hails from the Federated States of Micronesia and is the first Pacific Islander to travel down to the deepest part on earth, the Challenger Deep, which by the way, is also in the Federated States of Micronesia. On March 11, 2021, she joined scientist Victor Vescovo aboard uh, his privately owned submersible uh, the limiting factor to make that descent. And Ms. Yamase is accompanied on the call today by Mr. Willie Kostica, the executive director of the Micronesia Conservation Trust, a nonprofit organization comprising the territories and the freely associated states in the Micronesia region that supports biodiversity conservation, sustainable development, and uh, capacity development uh, of, of youth in, in the region. So without further ado, welcome to the both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having Hello, us. <laughs> Why don't we go ahead and um, start with you, Nicole? Can you? Wow, exciting! You uh, you've been in all over the news, uh, the Guardian, <laughs> all kinds of New Zealand, uh, even UH. I was just looking at their uh, article today about you, and uh, please tell us a little bit about what this, what's happening with with you right now, uh, following this expedition. Okay, so. Um, right now, I am slowly trying to get back on track with school. Um, once I got back from the trip, there's just been a lot of uh, media attention and interviews and requests. So it's it's slowly calmed down. So I'm I'm sh shifting gears now to speaking to the youth here in Hawaii and across Micronesia. So a few weeks ago, I got to. Speak speak to Xavier High School in Chuuk. I got to speak to the Micronesian Youth Club at JFK in Guam. Um, tomorrow I'll be talking to fifth graders at Kaulu Vela Elementary School. And then students for, from the Miley Mentoring Program at UH Manoa, which I'm a part of. So shifting gears to the youth because that's where I think um, I can have a a bigger impact on the kids talking to them or actually zooming face, you know, face to face, I guess, over computer to to really just talk to them so that they can see me and hopefully see themselves as well seeing them say that, oh, you know, she's a Pacific Islander, I'm a Pacific Islander, if she can do it, I can do it. So really just transferring and transferring this inspiration, motivation, this energy to the kids so that they could also want to do, uh, do amazing things and be a part of opportunities like this. Wow, well, we're so proud of you, Nicole. And, and I really like that, that you are shifting to the students and, and giving uh, some focus there. Uh, before we go further, could you tell us a little bit about the actual experience? On, let's see, on <clears throat> March 11th, that's when Victor and I went down in the limiting factor and that was a full 10 hour um, expedition under underwater four hours down two hours on the bottom and then four hours back up so on the way down four hours to some people it may seem oh my gosh that's a long time but to me you know with all the excitement going on and just the fact that we're going to the deepest part of the ocean in the world you know that just made time so fast for me. It didn't feel like four hours. Um, but during that time, Victor and I spent a lot of time talking to each other, getting to, you know, learning about each other's families and our background and our, our passions and what we want to do um, in the future. The two hours we spent exploring the Eastern part of the Western pool, um, to their knowledge where nobody has ever been to before. So, you know, just, me thinking like I'm the eyes of everybody, you know, of of the whole world of, yeah. you know, representing and, Pacific Islanders and being the person and everybody. that yeah. information 
to the well, surface. What did you see? What, did you see anything? What did you see when you were? It it looked like there? a a desert underwater with with scattered rocks here and there. Um, so I felt like I was in Star Wars when we got to the bottom of the of the Challenger Deep. Our first our first task was to locate the lander, and that lander gets dropped off before um, Victor and I go down. And it's a way for us to um, pinpoint where we are in the Challenger Deep. So once we got to the bottom, we had to find the lander. And, you know, it reminded me of R2-D2 and we're just like in our spaceship trying to find him, <laughs> which we did. It took about an hour to find him. And once we did that, then we were able to, you know, contact the ship on surface and tell them, okay, we found the lander and they're like, okay, this is where you guys are. So you guys can start exploring. Um, we tried to pick up some rocks with the arm. Well, Victor did. Um, Victor tried to pick up some rocks, but when he picked it up, it, it broke into pieces because it's the, the sediment down there is so fine. So, so we tried, but we just did a lot of exploring um, towards the slope. It was more of a slope towards the, um, the eastern part, but yeah, a lot of exploring, just looking yeah. around. So you were like in a, in, a, in a canyon, but also kind of on a desert floor, maybe. Yes, yes. Wow. So it, it really looked like a desert under, just underwater. I, I did a few numbers just to sort of give a bit of a comparison, and these are really rough numbers, but apparently the Challenger Deep is roughly a million uh, square miles. The FSM exclusive economic zone is a little bit over a million square miles, if you look at a map. And according to Google, with Grand Canyon is roughly 2,000 square miles. The Grand wow. Canyon. Uh, wow. That's the area. The, I'm talking about the area. Uh, and then apparently the, the Marianas Trench is a little under, so that's an additional part, is a little under a million square miles. So we're talking a really huge area here. When you compare it to those places, then you like, we get a better picture of the Challenger Deep and wow. it still blows my mind that yes. we got to be in that part of the ocean. Now, did, did they say, I read somewhere you were listening to ABBA, was that your <laughs> choice or Victor's choice? Uh, Victor, Victor asked me what kind of music I, I listened to and you know my mom being part Filipino I told him oh we love the oldies karaoke music like ABBA, um, Ronnie Millsap, Michael Learns to Rock, uh, Wilson Phillips <laughs> and he's like oh okay and he was like surprised <laughs> so he played ABBA um, Dancing <laughs> Queen so we were jamming to that in the summer <laughs> in the submersible um, he also played um, Smoky Mountain Rain by mm -hmm. Ronnie Millsap. Yeah, yeah. And Hit Me Baby One More Time by Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, um, Nicole, so now you are a student at the University of Hawaii, a PhD candidate. Can you tell us more about your studies and how did you decide to, what, what you're studying and how you, how you got there, what you did? Yeah. So my journey began at Savior High School. Um, well, okay, currently I'm working on, I'm looking at the effects of climate change on the marine plant community, but I'm also looking at, you know, competition between invasive and native algae, algae on our reefs. Um, like I said, it started at Savior High School. I didn't know what climate change was. And for one of our assignments, we had to write about uh, an environmental issue. And one of the topics that was suggested by Oh, the teacher was climate change. And so I was like, what is climate change? And I chose that topic because I didn't know what it was. So I did research and, you know, learned about um, sea level rising, the water getting warmer, um, erosion. And so I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I, I need to do something about this. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do marine or terrestrial. So when I graduated from Saver High School in 2009, I went to Chaminade University and participated in many summer internships for undergrad. Um, I participated in um, the undergraduate research mentoring program at UH Manoa. That was my first summer internship and I studied ornamental fish trade. So I did a lot of snorkeling and fish counts around Oahu. 
So I was like, okay, ocean, I have a taste for that. So next summer I'll do something different, terrestrial. So the next summer I applied for the Native American and Pacific Islander research experience in Costa Rica where I studied frogs. <laughs> Very different. So after that summer, I said, okay, you know, I have experience in ocean and frogs. So which one do I really, you know, did I really enjoy? And from those two experiences, I knew that the ocean was for me. So after that summer, I just continued to participate in summer internships focusing on on the ocean and my next summer I did macroalgae at the University of Miami in Biscayne Bay and that was the first um, summer internship or my experience working with macroalgae and that's how it all began and you know today I'm, I'm still studying macroalgae so it was from these summer internships that helped me um, narrow my my research interests and you know pave the way for me into graduate school. And, and how and when did your path cross with Micronesia Conservation Trust? MCT. Um, so I received the, the Bill Rayner Micronesia Challenge Scholarship in 2017. BRMC, they support PhD candidates or PhD students for three years. So I had it from 2017 to 2020. And I, I'm very grateful for, for that scholarship because it really helped me pay for a lot of my summer in uh, my research equipment because equipment is not cheap. Um, it's not cheap. And that's a problem that a lot of graduate students struggle with. You know, they don't have money to buy the equipment they need to do their research. And so with the BRMC scholarship, I was able to do that. And, you know, equipment is very limited. So I had to share one equipment with like five other lab members. And we had to, we had to work around each other's schedule. Like, okay, who's using it today? Who's using it tomorrow? And, you know, that would, that would delay our research, our field work. And so with BRMC, I was able to, to purchase my own equipment and, you know, not have to work around other people's schedules. I was able to just go into the field, use my own equipment, gather my own data on my own time on, with my own equipment, which is amazing. And, you know, not a lot of graduate students have, have access to that kind of stuff. So very grateful for the BRMC scholarship. Um, maybe we should bring in uh, Mr. Kostika, Willie. Do you want to join us a little bit maybe and tell us a little bit more about the Bill Rayner scholarship? Yes, um, so I know that you know Bill Rayner, um, who used to head the uh, Nature Conservancy's um, um, chapter or, or program in, in Micronesia and the Pacific, yeah, actually, uh, and at one point, um, Asia Pacific. And um, unfortunately, he passed away from cancer, uh, but he also gave uh, money uh, to seed the uh, Bill Rayner uh, Micronesia Challenge Scholarship and asked us, uh, many of his friends, to raise money to, to go into an endowment that would be able to support um, at least two students, uh, two new students every year who are uh, either working on a master's or a PhD. And, and so we, we, we did a... Um, big fundraiser and uh, we do have an endowment that we continue to build uh, but um, we've also received um, other grants that we're not allowed to put into the endowment but um, that are going to the scholarship uh, and we actually um, have used uh, those funds um, to build the endowment um, instead of dipping into the endowment uh, we've continue to use the, uh, the grant money to support uh, the scholarship, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I definitely remember Bill Rayner uh, from Micronesia and uh, Willie, I think one thing that I, I remember of, about Bill is that he also uh, mentored you. Uh, I think that uh, he, he, he spent so, together the two of you spent a lot of time and, and uh, I, did you start with the Pompeii Conservation Society? I think that was where you started. 
working with each other? Uh, so um, actually, um, uh, Bill started the whole uh, conservation movement in the FSM, starting in Pompey. Um, and, and I got involved um, in 1995 when uh, Rare the, uh, came and did the Saret, uh, you know, the Pompey Lorikeet campaign uh, to raise awareness on the Pompey watershed. And at the end of the campaign, a lot of uh, um, awareness was raised on the watershed, but it also made the lorikeet, the serret, the Pompey state bird. They actually uh, from that campaign and was so successful. Anyhow, they they brought me, uh, or I got, my myself and my family got really excited about the serret campaign, and I was working at the college at that time. Um, so we started talking uh, with Bill, and um, he said. Um, he wanted me to work for him at the Nature Conservancy. And we thought about it for a while and learned that the two of us were both visionaries. So it wouldn't make sense for me to be his deputy. And we decided that it would be better if I started my own local organization. And we was very fortunate because Palau had already started their Palau Conservation Society. And we were able to have discussions with Noah Ideong and other board members there uh, to help us start the one in Pompey. And so they uh, they challenged us to raise money that the Nature Conservancy matched. And we, we were able to raise about $24,000 uh, to launch the Conservation Society of Pompey. And uh, it took off from there. Uh, but yes, Bill was my mentor. That's uh, quite a history. I'm glad that we could touch on it. And now you're heading the Micronesia Conservation Trust, uh, which, uh, did I say it correctly, that all of the Ter Guam, the CNMI, Northern Mariana Islands, and the three FAS are all part of that or supporters yes. of that organization? Yeah, you, you are correct. We, we, we registered as an FSM organization, but then uh, in 2002, but by 2005, um, other jurisdictions were already saying, hey, we need uh, you working across the region. And, and uh, so we started uh, applying for grants uh, that covered the whole region, um, especially from the Department of Interior and other US federal agencies and US uh, private foundations uh, started to give us money for the, the whole region. Could you just talk a little bit more about the region and, and what it means to be part of that region? Yeah, well, uh, there are several things. Um, one is, um, you know, you, you can scale your your work pretty quickly um, and, and the, the money goes uh, a much longer way if you're involving the whole region. Uh, the other is that you actually, uh, um, you know, your, your, your area of learning uh, expands considerably if you're if you're working across Micronesia and not uh, not just in the FSM alone, and and of course um, you know um, we we're able to get uh, both um, our uh, donors and technical partners to uh, really support uh, larger regional initiative uh, uh, in uh, in in Micronesia, then uh, they would. Um, one of the things that we also started to uh, learn was we had helped to start all these conservation societies in across the uh, um, across Micronesia, and they started to compete for grants uh, against mm -hmm. each other. Uh, and so we said, you know, if we have one MCT that gets everybody's input uh, into one larger proposal and we apply as one, our um, ability to raise money has uh, gone up uh, considerably. So um, it's, it's a power in uh, uh, joining together. Um, and, and it's also a lot easier now. The, uh, they used to give smaller grants like US uh, federal agencies uh, here and there to different uh, projects uh, across Micronesia. And, and so they had to deal with like 10 uh, grantees. Now they're dealing with maybe one or two, um, and 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 also, 
um, you know, making sure that the, there's an organization here in Micronesia who's closer to the uh, to the stakeholders and who knows more than uh, you know what folks in in the U.S. or in Japan or in in Europe would. So we know the territory. We know who's um, doing well, who's struggling, and all of that. So we and because we're here, right. and so it makes a lot of sense for uh, an organization like this to be here. Right. Thank you for that. And and we actually did have an uh, an OIA conversation with you uh, some time ago when we first started this this series of conversations. So uh, first of all, thank you for for experimenting with us. And uh, I would refer people to to take a look at that video that talks a little bit. We go a little bit more into depth about the Micronesia Conservation Trust. Um, but still, there's a lot to learn from you and and what you all do. Tell me a little bit about the Bill Rayner Scholarship. How many students have you funded? Uh, and and how does how is the strength of it? How can people donate if they wanted to? Yes, so um, um, we're very fortunate uh, that when we started the Bill Rayner Scholarship, we started approaching different organizations about supporting, and we did get uh, a good um, support. But when we went to uh, an organization in Japan, they were able to work with us and with Sofia University. Um, and they can't, they couldn't give us money, um, but they, they, they were able to work with us and Sofia University, which is a Jesuit university in Japan, to give two full scholarships uh, per student. And the organization is called the Association for the Promotion of International Cooperation. And most of the people that work for it are, uh, former Japan ambas ambassadors to different uh, areas um, in the world. And so they, they sought the need to, um, you know, to help countries build their capacity that way. So, so in addition to folks like Nicole who received the Bill Rayner Scholarship straight out, and it's up to $30,000 per year um, that they're eligible for, um, we do have now that um, option of sending students to Sofia for a couple of years to their uh, master's program, which is a master's uh, in environmental studies that's uh, run by a, a professor from Canada who's lived in Japan for quite some time. And so, so right now we're able to support about uh, three to four students per year, um, two going to Sofia on that full a scholarship supported by Sofia University and APIC, uh, the organization I just talked about. And then we have folks like Nicole who are going to school in the US um, who are receiving the uh, Bill Rayner Scholarship. But um, the Bill Rayner Scholarship supports both groups um, because the uh, idea for the scholarship is to um, make sure that the students continue to stay connected to Micronesia um, we try to bring them home on every uh, break, um, you know, summer or Christmas, any possibility to having them come home um, to work with, and they're required to have a host uh, organization and uh, mentors uh, from the region uh, that help them through their studies. So it, it becomes a real practical, uh, you know, exercise. Uh, we're not just giving the scholarships and then ignoring the students. They were, and so, so far we've helped 15 and um, five have graduated and we have 100% retainage. So they're all back home uh, working in, in Micronesia, uh, in Guam, CNMI, FSM, Marshalls and Palau. Wow. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and we've just uh, interviewed three uh, young students last week. And yesterday I sent out a congratulatory uh, note to the two who are going to Sofia in August. So that, that'll make it 17. And then we of course have opened the Bill Rayner uh, Micronesia Challenge Scholarship, which is due on May 1st. So we're asking our Micronesian students to apply for that scholarship uh, 
and students uh, that expected to have students starting at the end of August as well uh, to support them. So, That's exciting. But, I mean, just yeah. one student makes a makes a huge difference. Small islands yes. and, and uh, the impact can be very huge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's 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 only in environmental uh, studies then, natural resources and natural resource protection. Perhaps, yeah, it's a very it's it's loose loosely defined. If if you're in uh, so if even students in law, and if they mm -hmm. are right now, we have a student at UH. Uh, Rockner Hatley from Pompey mm -hmm. is um, working on his law degree and um, you know uh, as long as he helps um, do environment uh, work and um, so he has a he has a, an exciting program because he's trying to he, he, he came and attended the, um, the, the Micronesia Association of uh, uh, Justices um, so Nicole's dad was there and uh, in the app and, and Rockner came and, and gave a present presentation on trying to either start environmental courts so that environment, environmental issues will be prioritized or some mechanism in the, uh, in the courts in Micronesia that would prioritize. Uh, we, we understand it's not easy to start an environmental court uh, by itself because that'll cost a lot of money. But at least there's areas around the world that have done this, and and so in, um, if we can't do a full-on environmental court, we'll uh, do, you know, um, some type of mechanism that would, um, you know, prior help prioritize uh, environment uh, work uh, in Micronesia. Uh, so and and because the the courts really don't focus too much on environment uh, related. Um, cases they, they're they're sort of pushed back because the capacity is uh, so low that they are dealing with more serious uh, cases. I see, and maybe we'll segue back to Nicole for a moment. I don't believe I heard what you're majoring in. Um, I'm getting my PhD in marine biology with a focus on marine plants. Okay, <laughs> and and. Could you tell us about your father? You told us a little bit about your mom, but I feel like uh, we need to, to ask you about your father as well. Yeah, uh, my dad is, he, he was born and raised here in Hawaii, um, in Pearl City, and he went to UH Manoa for his undergrad and he graduated from um, UH Richardson Law School. And he, he's been in Micronesia for over 25 years. So that's how he met my mom. And, you know, he, he just loves the island life. Um, he was the first, my first inspiration to go into marine biology. My dad, although in law, he has background in, in the marine sciences. He was very active in the marine option program at UH Manoa. And he would also, um, he had the opportunity to go up to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands as well to you know, do research, um, baseline research. So he has background in that. And so, you know, growing up, uh, we do a lot of snorkeling um, when we were younger and he would point out, you know, fish, coral, algae. And, you know, as young, when I was young, I was like, how does he know so much? And that, you know, that really motivated me to be like him. Cause you know, when I snorkel, I want to know what I'm looking at and, you know, what, what their, their importance is on our reef. So yeah, he was, he was one of the first, my, my first inspiration to go into this field. And, you know, it's, it's both my parents, both my mom and dad, who, who really provided a, a childhood just full of ocean memories. Um, my mom said that my first boat ride was when I was three weeks to black, <laughs> black coral. She said she just, they just wrapped me up on, and put us on a boat and went for our family um, sleep over there. And you know, I started. We were we were just always in the water. Um, every week, every weekend, we'd go to like the is it Pacific Island Club in Palau. We'd always go swim in the pool or go in the ocean. You know, we were just always in the water. Yeah. And my mom said I started swimming like I knew how to swim by the age of three. So, yeah, and just 
uh, very thankful for both uh, my mom and dad for for giving me this rich and full um, childhood in the islands. Yeah, well, so certainly uh, commendations and regards to your family. I know that they are very <laughs> proud you. of you, uh, and uh, we, we're sharing in that. Um, Philippe, would you like to ask a question from of our of our guests today? Thank you all so much for coming, Nicole. One question for you. Do you have any plans so far about what you would want to do after your dissertation goes through? Yeah, Whew. hopefully I can get that done by the end of this year. Uh, but I have so many goals and things I want to do with my degree. I want to, you know, I want to teach. I want to do research. I want to start an NGO. I just want to do everything. But like if, if I had, you know, all the money in the world, I would love to start a marine lab where I could, you know, provide the research experience that I had as an undergrad and bring it home. Because I know that many students don't have the opportunity to come out and participate in, in those summer internships. So, and you know, that's what really motivated me and pushed me to to pursue my PhD and that's what I want. I, I want the same thing for you know, students from Micronesia to have that, to have that background and research experience so that they could have that motivation you know, to, to pursue higher education. So yeah, I would love to start a marine lab and you know, train, provide training for um, the upcoming Micronesian scientists, um, mentor, uh, provide like role models for the the upcoming youth so just yeah I just want to do a lot of stuff <laughs> but definitely with a focus on the youth because you know they're they're going to be the future leaders of Micronesia and to be Pacific Islanders who have this this intimate connection with the ocean but also you know learning how to balance science and traditional knowledge is is what I aim for Willie, do you have any um, other points that you would like to share with us? It's, uh, I see the pattern of capacity development that started with you and, and the inspiration of Bill Rayner. And, and now those seeds have developed into uh, even further into Nicole and, and, her, and now she's working with, with students uh, that are even younger uh, than she is. And uh, it's exciting and I'm excited for, for you and the program and for, for all of you and for the region, it's, it's incredible. Uh, could you tell me uh, or tell us maybe what the reaction has been from the region about the program and 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 about the expedition? Has there been any conversation around that that you can share with us? Yeah, I think um, I, I know everybody that I've heard uh, from. They're so proud of Nicole, mm -hmm. and 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 she's really raised the profile of uh, the program and um, and Micronesia and our youth. Um, and so it's, it's really uh, helped. And we want to continue to work with Nicole and the other scholars uh, because um, one, of our, uh, one of the things that we are trying to um, make sure is that all our capacity pro building programs are building on each other. So um, um, in fact, the, um, the, the fellowship, uh, the professional fellowship program uh, that you are supporting and it looks like uh, the Weight Institute might also come in uh, and, and match that. So we're trying to, um, you know, connect um, those uh, the scholars with the uh, with the uh, fellowship pro the professional fellowship program, and of course the Micronesians in island conservation uh, and the Pacific Islands Managed and Protected Areas Community Peer Learning Networks. Um, so that they all are working with each other across the region. Just to clarify, yeah. so you're talking about the fellowship, the grant that you received from the Office of Insular Affairs uh, for fellowships. Oh, yes. okay, so it yeah. brings the, the those scholars. Okay, I get it. I'm seeing Yeah, it's not just the scholars. Um, it, it, we can't just limit it to the scholars, but we're hoping right. uh, a lot of the uh, those interns or uh, uh, professional fellows will be our graduates. Many of them are coming home and they already have a job, but uh, some may not have a job right away. So we want to be able to, uh, you know, keep them um, and, and they'll be prime candidates for, the, for those uh, fellowships. 
Um, and, and like I said, uh, we've got the money from DOI, but uh, it, we, we've talked about this with the Weight Institute, who's, who's also supporting work in Micronesia, and, and they're excited. They, they, wanna, they wanna fund two more. So uh, we may end up with, uh, you know, more more uh, than we expected. So, uh, which is uh, really great. Um, Nicole, I saw your interview with the president of Micronesia, uh, and uh, it's it's a it's a long interview. I do recommend folks to listen to it if they wanted to to know more. One of the programs that we have to help um, students who are um, not at the master's or PhD level. Uh, for mm -hmm. undergraduates, especially in the colleges in Micronesia, is, is called the Micronesia Challenge Young Champions Program, which the Department of Interior has supported mm -hmm. uh, for quite some time now. And that got started when I received my Pew Fellowship in 2006. Uh, it came with a $150,000 grant. And so I used uh, that $150,000 to support um, what was it, 10, 30 students, um, uh, undergraduate students, and the, uh, to help them with a little bit of their tuition. And then some of the half of that money went into um, doing awareness work on Micronesia uh, challenge um, activities in each of the uh, jurisdictions as well. So those students are some of the ones that are now coming back to, um, to work and, and even those are some of the students that are getting the Bill Rayner scholarship. So it's starting to sort of connect now. Nicole, did you wanna share anything? Do you have any thoughts that you wanted to share uh, as we close about your journey and, and what it means, what it has meant for you? Yeah, I, since I got back, there's just been an outpour of support and love from not only the Micronesia community, the Pacific Islander community, but really everybody around the world. And, you know, I've, I've, read, I've read a lot of messages like, oh, you know, my kids want to be just like you, like that, you know, it always makes me emotional. And it, it's just, you know, reminders, you know, that I have to keep moving and I'm on the right path. And, you know, hopefully I was chosen to really try and push students, especially Pacific Islanders, to really reach the, their potential and take advantage of all the opportunities that are available to us. Because um, my experience as an un, uh, during my undergrad, you know, there are programs who want Pacific Islanders. They because they want diversity, and you know that's what we have. That's what we can bring. And you know, I've had um, times where. Um, organizations or opportunities will say, we will save a spot for you because we want you to participate. And so, you know, there's so many opportunities for us and they're looking for us, they want us. And, you know, um, I just want, I just want all of us to really push ourselves because there are a lot of, you know, challenges, you know, just me being female or, you know, our cultural boundaries that kind of hold us back. And it's okay to push, you know, it's okay to push forward in, you know, we just gotta be careful of how we navigate things. But, you know, sometimes pushing pushing back is, is a good challenge, not only for ourselves, but those that are on the other side. So, you know, I've been in my PhD program for, this is year seven. But when I say that, you know, it doesn't feel like year seven because I've just been having so much fun and really enjoying the process of learning and overcoming all these challenges with all the amazing support from like MCT, um, Mr. Koska, you know, con the Conservation Society of Point Bay, the Weight Institute. And, you know, with the right resources, the right motivation, the right um, support, you know, we can really accomplish so much because there, there's a lot of space that we can fill. There's a lot of gaps for us Pacific Islanders and, you know, people better make room for us because we're, we're coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will give the last word to uh, my colleague, Mr. William Costica, but before we do, can you tell us about the island in the background of your picture? Oh, yes. This is the outer island, Pisar in Chuk. 
So I took this picture with my GoPro. I, I went out with a friend who took me out. Um, I usually, when I go home to Point Bay, I make sure I go visit my sponsor family from Saver High School. I always make a stop in Chuk, you know, to spend a couple of days with them. And, you know, I always, and to meet up with um, my Chukis classmates. So they always spoil me and take me out on the boat to, to go swimming and collect algae. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Nicole. We, we thank you and we uh, wish you all the best going forward. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kostika for our closing words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Tanya and Nicole. Uh, you know, the, um, we know Nicole has big dreams and um, we want to support, um, you know, her dreams to, um, especially to uh, do a research uh, center. Uh, maybe here in Ponte or in, in uh, one of the islands uh, in the FSM, uh, because we 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 know what it uh, what it um, it's like when you don't have data um, and you don't have uh, it, it's it's getting harder for us to write this um, you know uh, climate change uh, proposals without. The science behind them, because they are um, they are requiring those, and we have very little, um, um, you know, descaled uh, data um, in um, in the FSM because so little research has been done um, that is required, eh? and so you know we we want to make sure that we can support Nicole and other students so that we we actually have our own people doing climate uh, and another uh, marine research in, in Micronesia, especially here in the FSM. A lot has been done in, in Palau and um, you know, Guam and Sinai, but uh, very little here in the FSM and, and in the Marshall Islands. So we wanna be able to bring uh, FSM and RMI up the same level um, so that we can, um, we know what's happening in our waters, but also that we can use that information to help us when we're writing all these proposals. So, yes, we're we're very excited and we're looking forward to uh, working with Nicole to realize her dream of uh, starting a research uh, center here uh, in the FSM. Well, thank you very much on behalf of uh, Philippe, myself, and and the Office of Insular Affairs. Really, we thank you for for joining us for this conversation today with. Uh, William Kostika of the Micronesia Conservation Trust and Ms. Nicole Yamase, a PhD student at the beautiful University of Hawaii, uh, <laughs> who uh, is, was the first Pacific Islander to descend into the Challenger Deep, uh, the deepest part uh, on, our, on our earth. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Kalangan. Hey, Kalangan. Kaselelie. Kaselelie, Michael.